Hey guys, Johnny here from Ignite. Welcome to another video. As always, it's a pleasure to be here. We are going to be doing a video on Artists of the Floating World today. And we're going to be looking at the key themes. What is Artists of the Floating World fundamentally about? I'll try and give you a short and concise version of this. Hopefully for once, try and keep it a little bit shorter. And before we do that, please make sure you check out our website, ignitehsc.com.au. We've got an online portal, an online platform of tons of resources for HSC English texts, such as Artists of the Floating World. We'll take you through all of the close analysis. We'll take you through context, form, how to actually put the essay together, how to adapt to questions on the day of the exam. Everything's in there for you for a lot of texts, almost all of the texts being studied for standard, advanced, and extension. And lastly, if you do enjoy the video, please like and subscribe to our channel. In fact, if you've been watching our videos, please subscribe now. We rely on the subscriptions to motivate us. No, we don't, we're motivated anyway, but we do appreciate your subscriptions nonetheless. Uh, if you could subscribe now, I'd very much appreciate that. Let's get into the video. Okay, so what are the key themes in An Artist of the Floating World? by Kazuo Ishiguro, and this is a really powerful novel. Uh, if you're studying this or have just read this and are looking for some more information on it, you'll know it's really powerful, and it kind of leaves you questioning things a little bit, a few unresolved tensions, perhaps a few ambiguities left in your mind, and perhaps that is very much the point. But if we're looking at the key themes, what is this fundamentally about? I've narrowed it down to a few points. It's a non-exhaustive list, so there's plenty of other themes that go on in here. I'm just gonna to touch on a few that I think are important. The first one is the fallibility of memory. And I'll talk about this quote in just a second. The protagonist of this narrative, right? And this is a novel, this is prose fiction. It's a very non-linear narrative. The structure kind of takes us from past to present, past to present, because we are following the protagonist Ono, who is a former contributor, if you like. I'll say contributor, he's, he's an artist, but he actually was a propaganda artist before the Second World War and actually was the inspiration for a lot of Japanese soldiers who would have gone to war. So he was a painter and did propaganda and he probably didn't know at the time. And I think we kind of get that vibe from the story that he didn't know quite how severe the consequences could be of what he was doing when he was painting. He was just a painter, he got commissioned to paint something, but it was used as propaganda and actually made him, in a way, a contributor to the devastation of the Second World War. We know that Japan was unsuccessful in expanding their imperial empire, and actually, after the Second World War, after the dropping of the atomic bombs in Japan, right, his generation, as part of those contributors to the war, were blamed by the younger generations. We had this new cultural zeitgeist, a new spirit in Japan that was about democracy and was a little bit more westernized and Americanized, there a lot of American influence now in Japan after 1945. And Ono, the protagonist, is struggling to reconcile the fact that he could have been an influence of that devastation and he's being blamed for it and he resents people for that because he thinks, I didn't do anything wrong, I just was painting and I didn't know that this was gonna to lead to all that devastation, how am I to blame? That's kind of what he is struggling to accept and we'll get to that theme later. So we have here the quote, of course, that is all a matter of many years ago now, and I cannot vouch that those were my exact words that morning. So what you get out of this is this sense of uncertainty as to the past, because the whole time the novel is actually written in first person, it's from Ono's perspective, and we are forced to kind of question him when he says stuff like this, when he expresses things in this way, when he says, I'm not sure if those were my exact words, we kind of question how well does he truly remember his past? Perhaps he's remembering it in a way that is favorable to him because he doesn't want to accept the possibility that he was morally culpable for the devastation of the Second World War. So we see this idea that memory is fallible, that it can be wrong, that's what it means. Memory is not always accurate and you can misremember things and forget things and that changes everything in terms of how you actually perceive the past. So that's gonna be something that is prevalent that you'll notice throughout the novel and that's gonna make us question how reliable is Ono as a narrator because we have an inherently unreliable narration through the first person narrative voice because everything is told from Ono's perspective and yet he can't even remember everything precisely. So how much of the past that he's actually recalling to us, that he's actually recounting to us, I should say, how much of that is accurate? And that's what we're forced to question. Can we actually get an objective truth as to the past? Probably not. 
right? This is a very postmodern idea that there is no truth, we can't recall the past, we can never have the full context behind everything. So we can't know exactly what the truth is, it's all about what you believe to be true as a person. But that puts a lot of onus on Ono to come to grips with the fact that, hey, I could be wrong. Maybe I got everything wrong before World War II and now the younger generation who kind of resent the older generation for those mistakes, uh, maybe they're right. And Ono has to kind of accept moral responsibility throughout the novel or rather as the novel progresses, he is challenged to do so and he arguably does do so by the end. What about identity and the struggle to find meaning within context of social and political flux? Now, first of all, what does flux mean? Flux means a time of change. It is very transitional in the period in which this novel is set. The narrative is taking place after the Second World War, although there are obviously flashbacks. It's a very non-linear structure and it takes us from the past to the present, from the past to the present, which gets to that fallibility of memory and making us question everything, what really did happen. But we are in a time of flux because Japan is undergoing significant change economically, socially, politically. We've got a new democracy that is largely Americanized, very westernized, and we have the end of you know, Imperial Japan. It tried to expand and it failed in the Second World War. And these are very important because Ono's identity was shaped from a pre-war perspective, before the Second World War, as a painter, an artist. And his art was used as propaganda to actually influenced the Second World War. Soldiers were inspired by his work, no doubt, and they actually went on to participate in the war. So that was where his identity was tied to. But now after, when we see the devastation of the Second World War, and we see the younger generations coming up and a new cultural zeitgeist, a new spirit that is, a new cultural spirit in Japan that actually says, that's not what you should have done, you did the wrong thing, and he has to accept that, he feels displaced, he feels isolated in this new Japanese culture. And he has to grapple with that and realize maybe I have to take on moral responsibility and stop holding on to my former identity and accept that everyone's identity is always evolving and you have to adapt to your social and cultural context at all times. And that's something he will struggle to do and gets better at doing as the narrative progresses. We can see in this quote, if on a sunny day you climb the steep path leading up from the little wooden bridge, still referred to around here as the bridge of hesitation, you can see there the, the bridge of hesitation, very much symbolic for that idea that he has two identities or a former identity and a new identity and he is between two different views of himself, if you like, and he has to make change and embrace it. But of course, embracing change is not easy. People do hesitate because it's very uncomfortable to admit that you're wrong or admit that your former sense of self is no longer compatible with a new culture around you. Then it says, you will not have to walk far before the roof of my house becomes visible between the tops of the ginkgo trees. So he's been associated as being closely aligned with a hesitant mindset and he is hesitant and he has to really embrace the change and the uncertain, the unknown. He has to embrace the unknown and he has to embrace the fact that he probably was morally culpable in some way for the misgivings and the devastation of the Second World War. And then he has to try and find a new identity to really recalibrate and to belong in this new Japanese culture. The final theme here to look at is moral responsibility. You can think about this butler metaphor that Ishiguro, the author, actually talks about himself. And he says that, we all are servants to someone in some way. It's rare that you are the final you know, top decision maker of anything. Often what you do is going to be used by someone else and there are limits to how much you control how someone else uses what you do. So in Ono's case, he is or was a painter and an artist and his art was then used as propaganda to actually facilitate and, and further the participation of Japanese soldiers in the Second World War, which led to horrible things, as you all know. So he was responsible in a way, but he was so far down the line that he can't conceive of that responsibility straight away. He has to think a little bit more broadly. He has to stop being so parochial in his mindset and think, when I make a decision, I have to accept that there are far-reaching consequences that can happen and they can be morally grave ones. So he has to make that responsibility. We all are encouraged as servants or butlers of a kind uh, servants to someone else to think more broadly about what our actions might result in. And we can see this quote here, I'm not one of those who are afraid to admit to the shortcomings of past achievements. And interesting phrasing there, of past achievements, right? He viewed it as a past achievement, but he also admits here that it's a shortcoming because 
he is, by the end of the narrative here, he is coming to an acceptance of moral responsibility for those past atrocities and he accepts that I did have a limited perspective and now I see that what I did was wrong, right? Because he was so limited, he didn't see the greater consequences of his acts, which were devastating ones. So he struggles to assume responsibility, but arguably by the end, he really does make a good effort towards that. I hope that helps you guys with how you think about the key themes of An Artist of the Floating World. It's a great novel. I recommend reading it if you haven't already. And I will see you in the next video. Make sure you like and subscribe. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. If you do like the content, subscribe to our channel and we'll have more videos coming your way. That's right guys, thanks for watching and please make sure you check out our online resource database. We've had a team of state rank achievers and heads of English put these together for you, covering everything from essay structures and examples all the way through to craft of writing and comprehension skills. So check them out at ignitehse.com.au and we look forward to seeing you in the next video.